Hey guys, what's up? Aru. This video is every single tribe of Netland in Genshin Impact. In a nutshell, explain behind the video, I'll be discussing the lore of each tribe, what people live there, a bit of theory for what we can expect for the next patches, but more of the lore, really, of each tribe. Now, Netland's people are quite different from other regions since they're divided into six major tribes. And each of those tribes has their own unique sort of specialty that they're really good at. You've got the miners and excavators here who talk to rocks and who eat rocks. We've also got the bodybuilders and fitness influencers that live in volcanoes. And there's some weird voodoo type guys here. She's actually a granny. And we also have orphans that decided to make their own tribe for some reason. Now, there's only six of these tribes, but there's a lot of lore that I think is worth getting giving them their own spotlight for. But this isn't the every lore about every tribe. Okay, this is more of an overview of each of the tribe, what they're about, some notable characters, and maybe even an archon or two that originated from there, but mostly just lore, just so we can get you up to speed with all of them as they come out. Is that okay? I think that's okay. Timestamps will of course be down below, so let's get started. In a land with various different Saurians, there's always those few that end up being harder to handle. And the Saurian hunters of the Huitzlan tribe, just like Kanish, are trained to a perfect T to hunt and destroy these abyss-infected Saurians, or even Saurian-trafficking humans. You choose. His tribe, namely the Scions of the Canopy, are sort of adrenaline junkies that train in different extreme sports. Think of parkour using grappling hooks and riding Saurians across mountains. But their main specialty isn't as hunters, no. These guys are actually couriers and messengers that function as a delivery association but cranked up to 11. These guys don't mind jumping head first off of a cliff and Kenich is one such example. Just ask Kuhula how. His name translates to Sun God G which is an absolute flex of a title and he also carries the ancient name of Malipo, meaning Turnfire in Natlan, and Payment in Swahili. Ancient names are carried by certain tribe members that resonate with the personalities or traits of heroes from the past. And Kenichi's name was from a warrior named Burkina 500 years ago, which originated from Yupanqui, who is the very first Turnfire of their tribe. TLDR Yupanqui basically stole a white flame that can burn things just by looking back at it from a tyrant king named Ochkan, or Ok. Khan to save his people, but then that king had his revenge by making him turn his head to the fire, hence the name. With regards to Burkina, he's basically a hero that helped Mavuika save Natlan during the Cataclysm, which was inherited by Kenich as a special ancient name that includes the plan to save Natlan today. Now the Huitzlan tribe is related to the 13 heavens of Aztec mythology, translating to the sky with a big star, associating them with the Quetzalcoatl and the dawn as Saurian hunters and warriors who fly through the sky using stars, which is quite a fitting name. Their tribe is also dedicated to the Lord of the Night and the Turnfire Night tradition through the Saurian mountain king Kongamoto and a flame bearer. Speaking of Saurians, the Yunkasaurs not only help hunters complete their commissions, but they're also built for running vast distances and traversing harsh terrains quickly. But interestingly, the ancient Yunkasaurs were actually microscopic in size, and formed in mass numbers of millions, able to form green clouds in the sky, like a school of fish, but green and well, in the sky, which is confusing and terrifying at the same time. As an example of their extreme style, their ancient home at the Ancestral Temple is designed with that in mind, needing the help of Yumkasaurs to swing from one side of a mountain to the other, along with their own specific style of communication with the Night Kingdom using obsidian tools. Now, this place used to be their home and ancient turf, but now they basically use it as a playground for upstart Saurian hunters and warriors. Now if you're looking for a trendy necklace or an obsidian murder weapon or even want your own ancient name, then look no further than the Children of Echoes. Hailing from the tribe of Nanatskayan, they value stone and gems more than anything to the point that it's the only thing that they can sell. If you played through Natlan's quest for the first 5 minutes, then you've already seen that the Pitlisauri, chonky saurian that digs through the earth and munches on rocks like I show speed eating chicken. What's terrifying about this type of saurian is that their ancestors were actually the size of mountains that had mountains growing on top of them. Now you could say that Ejdaha in his prime is a Tepit Lissari and I couldn't agree more. He's a walking mountain that causes earthquakes from a mere nudge and is quite similar to the Tepit Lissari design. Now within the Nanatskayan tribe, we have two special characters. Kachina is inspired from the Native American Hopi Kachina dolls. She's a young warrior, excavator, breakdancer, and bearer of the ancient name Utabiti, which means resilience. 
And if you played the Archon Quest, her story is pretty much a rough gemstone, and that it needs more polishing to become a proper warrior and ancient name bearer like others. Then she's still young and has a lot to learn from her friends and coaches. Now, someone who doesn't need polishing is Shilonen, who is not only an ancient name bearer but also an artisan who can forge ancient names. She's actually the person who's going to make our ancient name as well as making Mavrika's indestructible sunglasses. Shilonen translates to the goddess of maize or corn, while her design is reminiscent of a feline, particularly of a jaguar or leopard. These are nocturnal hunters that sleep in the day and hunt at night, which is a characteristic of her personality in the teaser. Now as a chosen hero of Natland's 500 year plan, her ancient name is more unique, just like Kenichi's and is likely about forging ancient names as it is the main topic of their tribal chronicles in the Nanatskayan tribe. Their tribe translates to where the obsidian knives are creaking, which fits with their professions. Now something to note is that they didn't live in caves like these, but in a land that is more complete and pretty. But because of the cataclysm, their land was overrun by black sludges and abyssal monsters, of which was only saved through their tribe's own version of the celestial nails called shadow pins. Now these places with shadow pins are also the only area that they don't ever touch or mine since it's related to the abyss. Today they live in these cutouts of mountains which is honestly a structural hazard waiting to happen. Moving on, for those who want to hire a guide around Netland, or maybe feeling a bit lazy just looking for a place to wind down and relax, then rest your weary head on the hot springs of the people of the springs in Metzli. These guys are by far the most chill and relaxed tribe in all of Netland. They market their tribe as a place to unwind and relax, often a vacation spot for people from other regions. You can play beach volleyball, surfing, swimming, a sauna, any sort of leisure activity honestly. Their tribe is an island floating on top of a hot spring and it looks like a squid from above. Now their main jobs are actually as guides and wayfinders that make sure that the people that they guide through Netland are brought home safely. Their village means sky where the moon moves, symbolizing the goddess of the moon as well as reflecting their relations with real wayfinders that use the stars and the moon to navigate the seas. They're basically the mirror image of the adventurers guild but only within Netlan because Netlanians can't leave that land. Funny enough. Walani is one such wayfinder and guide who carries the special name Umoja, meaning unity from the hero Tupac 500 years ago of which she just awakened. Her people can utilize the Kohola source which can traverse water, lava, and what's called spirit ways in the human language, derived from the ancient dragon's phlogiston spirit ways. The ancient ancestors of Koholosaurs are said to have been as big as an island and the shape of their backs reflect the shape of those ancestors, either a stingray or a frog from what I could see. Because Koholosaurs can traverse lava and spirit ways, the people of the springs are also volcano managers, keeping them in check and keeping passerbys from going too far in, which you can find out about in their tribe chronicle quest. Now right above where they live is a set of floating and a single invisible island that is said to have healing properties called the Upper Sanctum, created by a sage that stole the fire of the dragons and weirdly enough wanted to be friends with the dragons. Other notable characters are Atea, who is the only NPC with a pyro vision as of now, and Cochanina, which was the pyro archon long ago who tricked the abyss into going to the sea. The most relaxed and chill freebirds of Natlan, penguins basically. But you know what is actually a freebird? The Flower Feather Clan. Just like many of you, I too wish to fly around Natlan, and if you're wondering when we'll get to ride this Saurian here, then say hello to the Flower Feather Clan. These guys fly around Natlan riding their Choo Choo Saurs, or QQ Saurs, a feathery bird like Saurian looking like flamingos because of their red color and long necks. Their tribe village is located around here, I think, on the side of a mountain with hot air balloons. Not to mention the white with red color theme with feathers that you can see from their tribes people. Now some quick lore about their tribe's origin is from the Chainbreaker Bow, which is about an unknown princess named Lianka who was raised by the mother of dragons, whereby through the concept of freedom made an orphanage-ish following that took in anyone from any origin. At some point they became the village that you see today, emphasizing freedom through their people and their Saurians. Something interesting is that our good friend Chaska is also from this tribe who was also raised by ocelots, I mean, Yukasaurs just like Lianka. 
Something interesting about Cheska is her affliction with abyssal sickness called a seed of conflict, which is quite similar to what happened with Child, and we all know how he ended up as. Now because Cheska was raised by Cucasaurs and had a seed of conflict within her, her personality gets a bit heated sometimes. Her pseudo-sister, Koichu, makes her mad so that she can let off some steam that might actually hurt someone else. A really good sibling, she is. Cheska's personality is free-spirited and is quite similar to Lianka who once wished to find her own path. So maybe her ancient name is related to that longing for freedom which fits with her animal vision. And the perfect Saurian for freedom is of course riding Cucasaurs, which makes their tribe animal. Now there are some people who can't ride Cucasaurs, which are called the wingless. But they're not weak because of that. The wingless often end up as powerful ground forces and warriors for the tribe, while some who can't fight take on more general jobs instead. We don't exactly know yet what element the Flower Feather Clan have, but I'm betting on animal since their origins emphasize freedom a lot. And we all know what kind of element freedom is based on Venti. So now that we're done with freedom, let's talk about discipline and weightlifting. If you're looking for the strongest person in Netland, then the Collective of Plenty is the place to be. These guys are the epitome of strength and fitness and muscles above anything else. They all have a special mission. A mission to become as strong as steel. Think of Sam Sulik or that one Mikasa gym lady as their strongest warriors. Their favorite sport is wrestling, while their jobs are fitness instructors and combat coaches, and their pastime is of course weightlifting. These guys talk a lot about unleashing their inner beasts through bodybuilding and wrestling, and a particular character who was a champion of wrestling is Kitera, who possessed a very, very heavy wrestling belt along with some particularly heavy teacups. Hunter Hunter references right there if you didn't notice. The Collective of Plenty's village is located next to a volcano. Remember my old Natlan video? Yeah, this was the Natlanians that I was talking about apparently. Now because they live in volcanoes, their soil is very rich and fertile, which is why where they live is also called the fertile lands. Now sometimes a little too fertile as they need structural renovations possibly due to being so close to volcanoes. Moving on, the Tatankasaurus or the Tanksaurus, which is their Saurians, are also the epitome of muscle, power, and strength. Built like a shield or a bull or maybe a gym enthusiast that became a fitness influencer. Next we have Jensen who is my favorite character since before 1.0 because she punches and kicks things who was also from the collective of plenty. She possesses a special ancient name and is the pride of her tribe as mentioned by Mavuika which I hope to god is a 5 star character. She wields an electro vision along with a bright purple and yellow color scheme of which their Saurian and their tribes people also has the same color. Other characters worth noting are Waskar from the Fertile Lands and Wanjiru from the Metsli tribe who helped save Natlan in their respective time periods. Another character is Varessa who was mentioned in the notice boards who trade with the children of Echoes. Now her name sounds a bit too close to Vanessa but it's too far of a reach. Anyway there you go, the tribe that made bodybuilding and fitness their entire personality. Going away from being fit and bodybuilding, let's talk about drinking shall we? Now when it comes to magic and mystery or shamanism and mysticism, no one can beat the Mictlan masters of the wind. These guys embrace the classic witch doctors of Natlan, phlogiston engravers, fortune tellers, doctors, potion makers, potion drinkers, basically the embodiment of tribal shaman people. Their tribe is named after the Aztec underworld Mictlan, where people go to after dying, masters of the underworld basically. Now their origins honestly go back all the way to the dragons and mortals, making a pact after the dragons fell, blending dragon powers with human curiosity and turning themselves into dream states, just so they can keep their village alive. Today however, their village is also in the process of renovation. Everything you know about tribe elders and their practices is this village and their people's specialty. Now because of their inclination to being diviners, they're also the tribe with the best ways to communicate with Wyobs and the spirits of the night kingdom. They can quote unquote bless weapons with the blessings that they give translating to the weapon's potency. They can also weave scrolls and tell the stories of the past as well as make for some very fine decorative pieces. Finally because they're really good at art 
artistry and paintings, they're also phlogiston engravers and graffiti artists. Some of the phlogiston engravings and most of the murals on the walls all over Natlan are the masters of the night winds doing. A very cultural and traditional tribe that you can honestly see from the edge of the map, found in a sort of valley or basin. The Ictomisaurus are saurians that can leap up high and become as light as a feather. But their origins come from the Ictomi, a spider trickster god that manipulates humans by shape-shifting into different forms. Ictomisauruses honestly look like the Wyabs of Natlan based on their drawings, which fits with their shamanistic occupation. Moving on, Granny Sitlali, the genius priestess of their tribe, could foresee that the travelers were coming to Natlan. She also has a cryovision, and based on their lore about the night and the underworld, their tribe and Sorian also might be cryo. Now, she's not a special name bearer, at least not yet, but her name, Sitlali, means celestial, reflecting her occupation or maybe even her ancient name given to her as a diviner and priestess of Natlan. Now another character from this tribe is Ororon, whose ancient name might honestly be to hear, which reflects him hearing things from their camp as said by Capitano. Other notable characters are Yamaya, a friend of Mabuika, and Sanhaj Kampore who could foresee the future just like Sitlali. Finally, Liliuo, which I think is the only enemy mob from their tribe and also wields a cryovision. To end this segment, here's a quote from their tribe. All has been understood and the future becomes the past. And that's pretty much it, the overview and short lore of each tribe of Netlan and their respective characters. Now I've been itching to make this video since the release of 5.0 and now that we're done we can finally talk about some theories like what the Fatui is doing, stealing Phlogiston and Saurians in Natlan, or the possible origins of Mavuika's design from Hoyo's older games. But those videos are gonna have to wait until next week's upload, I'm still thinking of what I should do first. So for now that's it from me, I'll see you guys in the next Natlan video, yeah? Like, comment if you enjoyed, subscribe and the bell for more of my ramblings and stay mad theorists. Bye!